Morning to the Saints at Oak Bay. Morning to the Saints at Westview. The last uh, couple years, it's been a, a joy to be able to connect virtually, but this is a whole lot better. So it's been it's been good to see you face to face, shake hands, cheer germs, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> And happy Christian fellowship as we were thinking uh, this morning. So be turning in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 4. If you're just joining us, we're in the midst of a, a conference weekend and we're looking at the ministries of Elijah and Elisha. And on the first night, uh, we looked at mainly the Elijah and we covered 1 Kings chapter 17 through 19. And that was divided in two parts. We saw the, the refinement for ministry, God is refining Elijah as well as working with the northern kingdom. And then we saw, um, thank you for that. Thank you. And we saw also for the last part of the, the study, overcome in ministry. And that can happen to each of us. If you didn't catch that message, it's been recorded. I think it'll be posted. And then yesterday morning at the men's breakfast, we looked at uh, the re mentoring relationship between Elijah and Elisha. And we shared 10 points, uh, thinking through the whole matter of mentoring relationships. And that message also was recorded. I think it's available. Some of the sisters want to catch that. And then yesterday afternoon, we started looking at the ministry of Elisha. And we'll be doing that this morning and this evening, concluding. I just want to plug the meeting this uh, this evening after our fellowship dinner, and I'll be sharing the gospel during that message, as well as I have special encouragement for the Lord's people to keep going on, and I, I just want you to come. I think you'll be encouraged, but if you know someone who doesn't know the Savior, this will be a great opportunity. Just tell them it's No Excuse Sunday and ask them to come, okay? That's how I actually was brought into a New Testament pattern meeting. Uh, a brother invited me to No Excuse Sunday, and I said, well, <laughs> I go to my own church on Sunday. He goes, I don't think you understood. It's No Excuse Sunday. <laughs> I said, no, I heard what you said, but I have my own plans. And he said, you know, some people say I stutter, but just in case you don't understand, it's No Excuse Sunday. And he just would not give up. And I went, and I never went back to the church I was going. I was so enamored with what I saw. I didn't understand it all, but I was just, that's how I was introduced to uh, New Testament pattern meetings back in um, about February of 1982. All right, so that's where we're going uh, for the rest of the day. And I also, before we get into the study of the word, I want to make you aware of, of our website, which is uh, Henderson. Warnay Henderson Publishing.com, and then also the YouTube channel, Henderson Publishing. There's over, I don't even know, over a hundred messages that have been posted on that. And also, if you've never been to Montana and you're kind of curious what it's like, there's one playlist that's nothing but bitter at hiking. Brent and I live in the Bitter at Valley in western Montana. So there's some hikes there that you can look at and and enjoy God's creation and it's a, it's a lovely state. There's only a million people in the whole state of Montana. I know that seems strange. I just got back from a conference from Houston two weeks ago, and I told Brenda, I said, do you realize that there's seven times as many people in the city of Houston there is in the whole state of Montana? So people are pretty spread out, pretty sparse, but it, it's a lovely state. All right, so we're in for 2 Kings chapter 4. We left off last evening with the miracle of the widow's oil. And the point was that she had to have faith to use what she had, and she had to have faith to use what was provided for her. And we suggested the application that in our praying, it's so often we pray, Lord, I need this, I need this, somebody needs this, I need healing, whatever. And those are fine things to pray for. But I find in my own personal prayer life, I'm pretty self-focused sometimes. And it would be great just to acknowledge, God, you're, you've given us these things already. How can we use what we have to further the kingdom of Christ. So try praying that way. God, thank you for what you have given. How can I use this to further the gospel? And don't be surprised if the Lord provides more and to enable you to do it. 
So we're going to pick up on verse 8 now. We're looking at uh, the Shulamite woman. It says in verse 8, Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, Look now, I know that... This is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please, let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there, a table, a chair, and a lampstand. So it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. And it happened one day that he came there. So this is Elisha. He came there and he turned in to the upper room and laid down there. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shulamite woman. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And I think she's probably standing in the doorway here. And that makes sense when, you, when we go through the narrative. And he said to him, so Elisha says to Gehazi, say now to her, look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. So he said, Elijah said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, well, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. So he called, he said, Elijah said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son. And when the appointed time had come, of which Elijah had told her. We'll pause our reading there. So we have this, this Shulamite woman. And she was a notable woman. And she sees the prophet of God coming by and she says, well, come on in and let's have a meal. And she says, whenever you come by, please turn in and, and we'll, we'll be glad to share a meal with you. And this went on and on. And, and apparently the prophet was making regular use of this woman's hospitality, benefiting from it. And so uh, the woman says to her husband, that's built on a little addition to our house, a little prophet's chamber, a, a, a little room that we can put a bed, a chair table, a lamp in it. And whenever he comes by, not only would he be able to benefit from the food that we provide him, but he could also have rest. And so they did that. Now, in this section that we're going to be looking at in chapter four, we'll find that God is going to call through the prophet, the Shulamite, three times. And each time that God calls her, there's something that's going to be revealed. All right. The first time she's called is in verse 12. Then he said, and Elijah said to Gehazi, a servant, call the Shulamite woman. And so she comes and Elijah says through his servant to her, listen, you've been very kind to us, very helpful. What can I do? Can I speak to the king on your behalf? Can I speak to the commander of the army on your behalf? And she says, uh, actually, I dwell among my people in peace. That's basically what she said. There's no issues, no problems. I dwell peacefully among my people. And so Elijah is like, huh, okay. What can be done for this woman? And then Gehazi suggests, well, you know, she, she, she doesn't have any children. Her husband's old. And so she's called a second time in verse 15. And Elijah says about this time next year, not only are you have a child, but you're going to have a son. And she said, oh, she thought maybe Elijah was jesting with her. No, you're going to have a son. And in fact, she conceived. And at the appointed time came, as Elijah told her, she had a son. So the first calling actually revealed the integrity of her heart. She wasn't serving the Lord to get anything back. She wasn't serving the, the prophet in order to have any special favors to gain something for herself. She says, everything's fine. She was happy just serving the Lord. And sometimes the Lord will bring situations into our life that 
like this situation will test our hearts. Why are we doing what we're doing, right? And if there's anything of a carnal nature, it doesn't count for eternity, right? And in the, the coming of the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, and we stand before him, anything that's not done in the power of the Holy Spirit, not done with pure motives for the honor and glory of Christ, is going to burn up. And we're going to be happy to see it go. When we see the Lord in all of his glory, we'll say, oh, Lord, that's putrid. Get it out of here. That was for my own glory. And so there's a testing of motive, why we do the things we do. And this woman had sincere motive. The second calling in verse 15 revealed the desire of her heart. She really wanted a child, especially a son, someone that could carry on the family name. And that was her deepest desire. Her husband was older. It didn't appear that that was ever going to happen. And she even thinks that the prophet's jesting about it. And so oftentimes uh, through life, there, the Lord is going to bring situations into our life that also reveal what we really desire. You know, what, what is the real focus in our life? And this is part of the purifying effect. We read in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29 that, that each one of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior, God is molding, shaping, refining, perfecting, and he is conforming us into the moral image of his son. And so as we grow in Christ each year, although we're not sinless, we should sin less, and we should be more like the Savior. And so sometimes things will come into our lives that will test the motives of why we do things and also um, show us what we're really desiring. I remember... It's been about 20 years ago, I was working with a young man I met at camp. He had a, um, he was addicted to pornography. And I was really trying to help him and trying to get him to where he could be liberated from that. And sometimes he would call, he called at like 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. And if I get woke up at that time of morning, I'm done. I'm not going back to sleep. And I remember one time he called and I'm, he's crying, I'm talking to him, I'm praying with him. But I got off the phone, I remember saying to Brent, I said, I wish this kid would get, get it together, right? And I started thinking, you know, the Lord says, but before we can help a brother or sister get that speck out of their eye, we got to get the log out of our own eye. Well, the log is un christ like attitudes. And sometimes the Lord will bring situations into your life just like this that kind of expose your motives and your desires. Well, I had I had a log in my eye. How could I help him until I first deal with what's unlovely and what's not Christ-like? That's the log. It has to be pulled out. And so thank the Lord for these things. And here we have the woman she's called second time. It shows the desire of her heart. She really wanted a son. And God blessed her with the son. Verse 18, and the child grew. Now it happened one day that when he went out to his father, to the reapers, he said to his father, my head, my head. So he said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. We're not told the age of the son but it, clearly, he's able to express himself in speech. He's sitting on her knees. It's not like she's got him in, you know, cradled in his bosom. So she, the, the boy might have been three, four, five years of age. And the boy dies. Maybe some kind of an aneurysm, something in the head. We're not told. But he dies. And he clearly dies out of the text. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon that he died. Now notice what she does. Verse 21, she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him and went out. I want to suggest to you that in the mind of this woman, this is not a done deal. She takes him up to the prophet's chamber, the man of God, and lays the boy on the bed. And now she's going to uh, jump into action. She goes to her husband. She says, please send me with one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run 
to the man of God and come back. Notice that run. Now, Elijah is at Mount Carmel, verse 25. She's at Shunem. That's almost 20 miles difference. And not only do you have the difference, uh, you've got to cross the river too, Kishon River. And so that was, uh, you know, this was not an easy track. And so her husband says, um, why today? Um, it's not a festival. It's not the Sabbath. Why do you want to go see the man of God today? Evidently, she did not tell her husband that the boy had died. I doubt that uh, he would have let her go if she had. And so she, she kept um, saying, it is well. In other words, there's an important reason. I, I need to go see him. And so her husband apparently agreed. And then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me until I tell you. So it's around noon when this occurs. And she saddles a donkey and she tells the servant, you go as fast as you can unless I tell you to stop. And time is of the essence. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever ridden a donkey before. I'm just curious. Anybody ever ridden a donkey here? This is not, um, <laughs> this is not like riding a bus, okay? I grew up on a, a farm in Kansas. We had horses. We had one donkey. I worked on Charlet Ranch. We checked uh, cattle on horseback. And I had the big idea one day that I was going to break the donkey. And it didn't go so well. I got hurt, actually. Later, the donkey was broke. But that donkey was the roughest riding critter you could ever hop on. It was just like, bum, 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 bum. And so I see this woman. She's... Uh, she's pressed for time and she's going as fast as she can to the man of God. And can you imagine this jarring for 20 miles? I don't know what the speed she could have gotten, maybe four or five miles an hour. Maybe, maybe she got there in four or five hours, but it's, it's clearly late afternoon before she can get there. So she goes to Mount Carmel so it was, verse 25, when the man of God saw her far off, that he said to the servant Gehazi, Look, the Shunammite woman, please run now, meet her, and say to her, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? And she answered, It is well. She wasn't going to talk to Gehazi. She was taking her request right to the one who had promised her a child. Now when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet but Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God, Elijah, said, let her alone. For her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. So she said, did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, get yourself ready. Take my staff in your hand. Be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. If anyone greets you, do not answer him, but lay my staff on the face of the child. The mother of the child said, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. She, so he arose and followed her. Now Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore, he went back to meet him and told him. So Gehazi goes back to meet Elijah, saying the child has not awakened. We'll pause our reading there. So she gets all the way to Mount Carmel. She makes this 18 to 20 mile journey. It's late afternoon now. She's crossed the Kishon, uh, Kishon River to get there. She's taking her petition right to the man of God who promised the child. Gehazi comes out, says, well, and when she gets up to Elijah, she basically falls at the, at the feet of Elijah. And, and Gehazi tries to push her away. This was not proper protocol. And Elijah says, no, let her be. She's in deep sorrow, and, and God has not shown me what it is. In other words, God wanted her to articulate the deepest matter on her heart. And there is something that is therapeutic about forming the words of the burdens on her heart. We read in 
uh, Romans chapter 8 and 26, that sometimes there's deep burdens and we can't even articulate it. And the Spirit of God makes perfect intercession for us in those times. But there, our, our Heavenly Father wants to hear from His children. He wants us to uh, bring our petitions, our needs before Him, the heaviness of our heart. It's like Habakkuk. Uh, it says that uh, when he, he saw the burden... And so he's the word there in Hebrew means to lift up. And so his burden was lifted up to the Lord. And God wants us to lift our burdens up to the Lord, articulate them, express them to him. And so apparently, because God didn't show Elijah, the woman had an opportunity here to articulate the deepest need on her heart. Her son was dead. I just a practical point here. There's a time and place for formality. Uh, but this wasn't it. And sometimes in our interactions with other believers, even in our church meetings, there will be things that will happen. And it's like, hey, this is not the norm, right? It's an unusual situation. And, you know, extend grace. Sometimes there's not uh, a need for formality. Um, sometimes there's more pressing matters. And what I found in in past assemblies, when there's been issues like this, if it's a pattern, deal with it. It's a one-time thing. Uh, grace can overcome that. Sometimes it's just a teachable moment. And here we have a, a situation where it wasn't a, a time for formalities. There was a deep-seated need that needed to be addressed. And so the Shulamite expresses herself. Gehazi sent on with the prophet's staff. The staff represented God's authority. And Gehazi gets to the child, puts the staff on the child, nothing happens. Gehazi goes back to Elijah. Well, we can see the wisdom in that. What would have happened if that staff had been on, laid on the child and, and the child uh, woke from the dead? What would have happened? Well, instead of worshiping Jehovah, people would have started looking at the staff as something special, right? Think of the bronze serpent, right? The bronze serpent uh, picturing uh, sin, bronze, judgment lifted up in the center of the camp. It's a beautiful picture of Lord Jesus Christ, which he ties in John 3 to himself. And the, the fiery serpents come out, and they're because the Israelites have been murmuring, complaining against God, God is punishing them. And if you get bu got bit by one of these serpents, you died. And so the people repent, and they called out for the Lord. And, and God says, all right, so the solution is make a serpent bronze put it on a high pole in the center camp and if by faith someone will look at that serpent and they've been bit they'll live and the lord says well that's picture me i was made sin at calvary for you i experienced the judgment of god that's the bronze i was lifted up on the pole that's the cross and the same is true when we realize that we're snake bit we have a deadly disease caused sin and we don't want to go to the lake of fire we want to be saved then we can look at christ and receive the free gift of salvation well, what happened to that bronze serpent over time is it became an idol. And Hezekiah had to destroy it because the people started worshiping the bronze serpent instead of the Lord. And so we don't need all these middle ground things. I mean, let's face it. We tend to love ritual, ceremony, rote. I mean, how many of you sit in the same seat on Sundays, Sunday after Sunday? How many of you park in the same parking spot, right? That's just the way we are. And so it's easy to slip in tradition and rote. And uh, sometimes these things become so ceremonial that they almost become like wrong if we don't do them, right? So we need to be constantly thinking through these things. Uh, it's easy to start bringing Judaism into Christianity and start thinking, oh, I need this religious experiment, the stained glass windows, the incense, the candles, all of it. Well, that's all out of Judaism. There's nothing religious about that at all. No help there at all. In the church age, it's Christ. He's the center of attention. That's what draws us together, as our brother was reminding us this morning. And so we need to be careful that uh, the staff wasn't going to become uh, a, a, a focus of idolatry, something that would draw people away from the Lord. So Elijah arrives. He came to the house, and there was a child lying dead on the bed. It's got to be, I, I think it's at least 9 or 10 o'clock at night now. I mean, there's been almost a 40-mile trek here. Uh, 
thanks to the donkey, probably went a little bit better, but it's got to be very late. And he went in and therefore shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and laid on the child and put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child, and the flesh of the child became warm. He returned and walked back and forth in the house and again went up and stretched himself out on the child. And then the child sneezed several times, uh, sorry, seven times, and the child opened his eyes. And I made the, the point um, when Elijah raised up the widow, the Zarephath widow's son back in 1 Kings 17, the number three was present. The number three is one of four perfect numbers. It's tied to the triune essence of God, the, the Godhead, but it's also tied to resurrection. And in both these first two resurrections in the Bible, you have the number three. Uh, you have Elijah um, laying down and so forth on, on the person, the child three times. Here you have mouth to mouth, eye to eye, hands to hands, the number three present in the resurrection. A little detail, I think the spirit of God slips in there again to give us these layers and layers of truth in scripture. As you probe down, it's just incredible the amount of detail that's uh, contained in the scripture. And so uh, the child sneezes seven times. The child opened his eyes, second resurrection in scripture. And he called Gehazi and said, call the Shulamite woman. This is her third call. So I, she was very close. She was right there. She was waiting on God to do a great miracle. As I said before, I think in her mind, this was not a done deal. God had promised a child. God had given her a child. And she believed that God was going to give her back her child. And so that's why she put the, the boy up in the prophet's chamber. And so he calls her. He, she came into him and said, pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. And so the second calling uh, shows the the essence of her faith. She didn't doubt. She knew that her God was able to do an impossible miracle, bring her promised son back to life. And through the prophet uh, Elisha, the son came back. So there's some practical things as we look at this text concerning the Shulamite. One is, and I were I was thinking about this with you yesterday. Use what you have to bless the Lord's people, and most of us have homes that we can use to have the Lord's people and bless them. Great opportunity to do ministry, great opportunity to share the gospel with those who don't know it. We're to be given to hospitality. Uh, elders, it's one of the criterion for present tense criterion for being recognized. Someone that opens up their home and uses it uh, to bless the Lord's people and do shepherding ministry. And then we also saw that don't be surprised with the Lord brings certain situations into your life that it's going to probe your heart. It's going to show your motives and things, why you're doing what you're doing. It's going to show uh, what you're really living for, what, what's really important to you. And also, it's going to show the validity of your faith. Think of Genesis chapter 20, when God came to test Abraham. Go offer your only begotten son. On in Moriah Mountain, I'll show you as a burnt offering. Hebrews 11 tells us that Abraham didn't even ask why. He just got up and did it. Now that's faith. And Hebrews 11 tells us that although there hadn't been a resurrection in scripture before, Abraham knew that God was a covenant keeping God and that Isaac was the only begotten son, the son of promise, the one that he would fulfill his promises to Abraham through his that genealogy, that lineage. And so Hebrews 11 tells us that if Abraham struck him down, God would have to live him right back up. He believed in a resurrection, even though there had never been a resurrection before. That's the kind of faith that the Shulamite is showing us. She believed that her son could be raised up. So when these hardships come in and these trials come in, these things that probe our heart, Thank the Lord for those. They, they often show what's lurking in our hearts that shouldn't be there, right? 
Job, a righteous man, none like him in the whole earth. Well, that's a pretty high accolade by God, right? But there were things in Job's heart that Job didn't even know were there. And so God leads him into a trial, an incredibly hard trial. And in the process of time, those things that were lurking in his heart came out. And he, Job accuses God of abusing his power and wisdom, not being fair with him. And then the Lord comes to Job. Can you imagine the God of the universe standing before you in a tornado saying, stand up like me as a man. I have questions to ask you. <laughs> and it took two rounds, two rounds. God had to come again in a tornado. Second round, first time he says, oh, I'll be still. I won't say anymore. But you know what? Silence isn't the same as repentance. God had brought him part way. He had to come a second time. And then at the end of that, Job says, I repent and dust it at. Well, that's where God wants to get all of us. A place of utter brokenness, utter repentance. And as a result, Job was refined. He was greatly blessed. The devil was cast down, defeated in the thing, and God was honored. So it was a win, win, win. And that's what happens when we allow God to take these experiences and probe into our hearts, showing our motives, why we're doing things, what's important to us, and also the validity of our faith. And so those are some practical things that we can glean from this text concerning the Shunammite. So we're going to look uh, very quickly now at these last two miracles uh, into chapter 4, and then we'll be picking up this evening, if the Lord had be not come, in chapter 5, we'll be looking at uh, Naaman, the Syrian who had leprosy. So two more miracles. These are short. Verse 38, Elijah returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in the land. Now the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said to his servant, put on a large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. So one went out into a field and gathered her herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it a lap full of wild gourds and came and sliced them into a pot of stew, though they did not know what they were. Then they served it to the men to eat. Now it happened as they were eating the stew that they cried out and said, man of God, there's death in the pot. And they could not eat it. So he, Elisha said, then bring some flour. And he put into the pot and said, serve it to the people that they may eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. Well, these are desperate times. There's famine. There's not enough food for the prophets, sons of the prophets to eat. And Elijah says, well, put on a big pot of stew. It's like, well, we don't have much to put in it. And so they go out and they gather what they can, a wild herbs. And apparently they found a, a vine that was a wild gourd. And we know what this is now. It's a colocynth. It, it's a, a vine that looks like a cucumber, and it produces a fruit about the size of a cucumber, but it's orange, and they would have sliced it up and put it in the stew. Well, this particular colocynth, it has a neurological effect, and if you eat too much of it, it can kill you. And so apparently they started eating it, and they started probably feeling some of the effects of it. And they, they said, oh, there's death in the pot. And maybe they were fearing for their lives and what they'd already eaten, but they knew they couldn't eat any more of it. And so they're hungry. It's, they're desperate. Um, it's a famine. And so they, they really want to eat, but there's death in the pot. They can't eat it. And Elisha says, just bring me some flour. And so he casts some flour in it. He says, okay, go ahead and eat. It's fine now. I'd be saying, okay, you go first, right? <laughs> Well, this is a supernatural, it's like putting the salt in the well at Jericho. Salt doesn't improve water quality, but this is a supernatural. There's a lot of symbolism in what was going on. And I want to suggest to you that the fine flour here, it, we have these five Levitical offerings in Leviticus 1 through 7. The second offering is the meal offering. And that, that was a fine flour that was used in the meal offering. There were several different kinds of things that could be offered in the meal offering, but it pictures the fine character of the Lord Jesus Christ, that holy character of Christ, uh, the things that God appreciated about his son and character. And so 
Elisha represented John the Baptist and his ministry. He's calling the people to repentance, calling fire down in judgment and so forth. Very spectacular public ministries. But Elisha pictures the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's among the people, uh, meeting the needs that he sees one-on-one, -on -one, champion of the people. And so I'd like to suggest to you that there's a, a, a picture here of the Lord Jesus Christ that we can appreciate. See, we had death in our pot, too. We were all born from our first parents. And because of Adam's sin, that nature has come down to each of us. It's a corrupted nature. It wants its own way. It rebels against God. It's gone down from generation to generation. And if you have children, I know from our four kids, we had to teach none of them how to sin. Right? It just comes out of them, right? You know, one pulls a hair, the other one pulls a hair back, right? It's just the way it is. And that's the nature we have. And so as we get older, that nature within starts coming out in behavior. It's evident. It's corrupt. It wants its own way. It's selfish. It's carnal. And so um, the Lord Jesus was not. He was sinless. And so we had death in our pot. And how did the Lord Jesus fix it? Well, if he pictures the flower and death was a problem, he jumped into death. He jumped into the pot. That was the way he fixed it. That's the way he brought salvation to us. He took our place. And that's the only thing that could fix the death that we were destined to have. Uh, eternal death because of our first parents' sin, a nature that we received and one that we prove out in our own doing. And then the final miracle that Elijah does here is another one that so beautifully pictures the work of the Lord Jesus. But his servant said, what, oh, verse uh, 42, then a man from Baal Shelishah and brought the man of God bread of first fruits, 20 loaves of barley bread, and newly ripened grain in his knapsack, all right? So he's carrying this on his back, and it was a fine uh, offering for the sons of the prophets, a, a provision for them, but it's not near enough to feed all the sons of the prophets. And he said, give it to the people. Elijah says, give it to the people. So this man's donating what he has. It's his first fruits. There's 20 loaves of barley bread. There's some ripened grain in his knapsack. He says, give it to the people. They may eat. But his servant said, what? Shall I set this before 100 men? And he said again, give it to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. Well, does that sound pretty familiar? That sounds exactly like what the Lord did in the feeding of 5,000 men plus women and children. And then later, 4,000 men plus women and children. Um, I'm doing a Bible study with a 10-year-old named Ari, and we just studied this miracle of feeding of the 5,000 plus women and children this week. And he says, well, why was there 12 baskets left over? I said, well, how many disciples were there? He said, 12. And I said, what did the disciples have to do before they got to eat? And he looked, he said, oh, they were, they were serving. They were feeding the people. I said, that's right. So we serve, and the reward comes later. And they each got a big basket full and he says did they eat all that by themselves well i said but you know the reward what the the thing is the reward the lord gives us is going to be so much more than we can imagine and that's the point and so uh reward comes after serving right paul picks this up in romans 8 he says the the glory comes after suffering and there's an order and and Paul says, you can't even compare the glory to come to what you're suffering today. And so 12 baskets full, yeah, it was more than disciples could ever eat. That's the whole point. God is very gracious in the way he rewards. And in this uh, parable, we see the sons of the prophets, they've been faithful. And so God provides them ample, and there's some left over. And that's the way the Lord, uh, we've been in full-time work for 24 years now. And I can tell you, there's been times we've been tried and challenged, but the Lord has been so faithful to us. 
Uh, when we had two sick adult kids, we were bleeding out thousands of dollars every month and trying to care for them. And the Lord got us through that. And Brent and I can tell you that the Lord is faithful. Uh, he, he protects his own. He takes care of his own. And it's just great not to have to worry about such things because he is a covenant keeping God. And it, it's wonderful going on with him in life. I am one with the Lord. Whatever comes into my life comes into his life, and he keenly feels it. And that's a great way to go through life, knowing that um, he's with me in every situation. He knows what I need. He knows how I need to be refined. He knows uh, how to take care of us. Amen? He knows how to take care of us. And so what we see here in Elijah in the care of the prophets, removing what they didn't need that would cause harm, and then providing what they did need to encourage life. That's what the Lord Jesus does with us as well. And it's great just to go on with him and have that kind of trust in him. So I've really enjoyed this study of Elijah because in so many ways, it just shows the loveliness of our Savior and his care for us. So tonight, we're going to pick up in chapter five. I'm really excited about this lesson there's some things I've never seen before until I did this study. I'll be sharing those with you. Again, if you know someone who doesn't know the Savior, please uh, encourage them to come. We'll be sharing the gospel. But I also will be closing the time with some uh, application I think you'll find very encouraging just to want to keep going on with the Lord Jesus Christ. I really believe the trump is not that far away. And uh, we just need to finish well. As I said um, in one of the sessions, we're only here for one reason, and that is for the praise of God's glory. Paul says that three times in Ephesians 1. We're only here to make God look good. Anything beyond that doesn't matter at all. We're only here for the praise of God's glory. Amen? Father, we thank you for our time this morning. We pray that the application that you've provided from your word has hit its mark. We pray, Father, each one of us will be encouraged be thinking about something that maybe we can improve, something we can do different. Uh, we want to be made more like the Savior, Father, your Son. We pray that you would just help us in every way to exalt him in our lives, to live for him, to go on with him. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Yeah.